Thank you, Cindy. Can everybody hear me okay? And hello to everybody in Zoom. We can we can move this. We can move this. Uh, I'll try to hold my hold the mic. So uh, this has been a long time coming. I've, you know, I, I do speaking to groups. I speak to caregivers and care organizations, and I've really been looking forward to coming out here and visiting with you today. We did not know if this was going to happen <laughs> when we started planning it. And this is the second in-person presentation that I've done in 2021. Everything else has been virtual and online. So I'm just super happy to see your faces in person and to have this opportunity. <clears throat> in my neighborhood, I've, I've lived there for about 14 years. And we used to live on a dead-end street, and now it's no longer a dead-end street. Um, there are things like this happening at the end of the road, and it's now a through street. <laughs> didn't, didn't really appreciate that, but um, we have a through street now that I live on, and I'm seeing these uh, frames go up of homes. And when we think about framing and a framework, it can be a physical structure like this. It's something that kind of hangs it all together, right? And, but when we think about a framework, it, in terms of a concept, it can be a way to think about something. And today, what we're going to do is hopefully establish a, a new framework to think differently about caregiving, to think about what you are doing day in and day out, and hopefully this will give you some insights and some tools that you can use to uh, Frame your care experience and figure out how to make life better for you and for, for your loved one. Now, as we go through the, the presentation today, you're going to hear a lot of things, and I hope that some of those things will be helpful. But you're also going to have a lot of thoughts that will enter into your mind and some feelings that will enter into your heart. So in addition to what you hear, I would ask you to pay special attention to the thoughts of your mind and the feelings of your heart. And make note of those, because those thoughts and those feelings are coming to you for a reason, and I may not know what those are, but they are meaningful to you, and they'll help you as you figure out how to be a better caregiver. So in that regard, I'm gonna ask um, Alicia, yeah. can you, can you help, help us out for a minute? So, um, I have these little cards here. Alicia's going to hand out, just if you could give a card to each, each person here. So this is a, a blank card here. And uh, at some point in the presentation, uh, prob near the end, I've, I'll invite you to write down something that you heard or something that you thought or something that you felt that you really want to remember from today's presentation. And uh, so that's what this card is for. It's blank right now, but hopefully by the end of our time together, you'll write something on there that you would like to remember from today's presentation. So a little bit of uh, background on me. Many years ago, um, this is over 20 years ago now, I worked at the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I was a healthcare policy bureaucrat. I worked in the Disabled and Elderly Health Programs group of the federal Medicaid program. But if I'm being honest with you, I didn't really understand a whole lot about what it meant to be elderly or disabled. I know it might be shocking to you to find out that there was a, a person in the federal government that was working on something that they didn't really understand very well. <laughs> but that is true, I, I was in that position. Well, all of that changed when my mother-in-law got a brain tumor. I'm wondering, can we close that door just uh, so that uh, everybody can hear better? Thanks. She was 59 years old. I was 29. My wife was 30. And we had three young children. And they gave my mother-in-law weeks to live. They said that she needed immediate brain surgery and that 
if the brain surgery was successful, if she survived the OR, she might live six to nine months. That was the best case scenario. So of course she had the brain surgery, and I'll never forget what she looked like. When she came out of the hospital, she looked like Frankenstein. They had shaved her skull and they had staples, staples all the way up and around her skull like that. She needed a place to stay to recover from her brain surgery for two weeks, so she moved into our home. She was supposed to stay with us for two weeks. She stayed in our home for almost two years. She went through radiation, chemotherapy, another brain surgery while she lived with us, and she was a miracle. She ended up living for five and a half years after that original brain surgery. But she was in a steady state of cognitive decline for that entire five and a half year period. Her mind was never the same. She, lo she lost a lot of her functional capabilities, and we were her family caregivers for five and a half years. That's what we did. Even after she moved out of her home, out of our home, she was in her own place, we still had to go over there and help her all of the time. So our lives were upended by caregiving. I was not prepared to be a family caregiver. If I'm being honest with you, um, I, I struggled with the role the entire time that I was doing it. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But after my mother-in-law passed away in 2005, I changed the course of my career. I left Medicaid and opened a home care company to help families like mine. My company served thousands of families over the course of about a decade in Virginia and West Virginia. And we serve people with all different types of health conditions, and I discovered how much caregiving affects not just the individual who's receiving care, but also the entire family. I also went back to school and got a doctoral degree, and I am not a medical doctor. My doctoral degree is in learning, in education. And um, I studied caregiving as a transformative learning process. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. In 2017, I sold my home care company and started caregiving, caregiving Kinetics, and since then I have devoted myself to helping caregivers all over the globe. I've been able to travel all over the nation, been to Europe to talk about caregiving, worked with care organizations. I'm an adjunct professor at Shenandoah University. I teach healthcare management and public health. But this, this is my passion, helping caregivers, because I have been in this position, I understand how challenging the caregiving role can be, especially for families. And so that's why I'm so excited to be here with you today. I also uh, published a book about a year ago, When Caregiving Calls, Guidance as You Care for a Parent, Spouse, or Aging Relative. It was an editor's pick by Book Life Reviews. They said this outstanding guide will be a lifesaver for anyone saddled with these immense responsibilities and seeking peace of mind. <clears throat> And the book has actually won a couple of awards. It was the best indie book award winner in 2020 for the caregiving category. Uh, the Independent Publisher Book Awards also gave it a, a bronze medal in the aging, death, and dying category for 2021. So that's pretty cool. As we get into our conversation about caregiving, I'd like to just give you a little bit of a, an idea of how many caregivers are out there. Sometimes people are surprised to learn how many caregivers there are out there. There was a report that was released in 2020 by the AARP and the National Alliance for Caregiving. This was pre-COVID, and it said that there were approximately 53 million Americans who were offering some kind of unpaid, informal caregiving assistance to a loved one in the past year. 53 million adults. That's about 21% of the adult population in America. That is a lot of people who are serving as caregivers. At the same time, caregiving can feel extremely lonely, extremely isolating. You could feel like you're the only one in this position so recognizing the numbers, the vast numbers of caregivers that are out there, 
is, I think, very important. Another thing that I'd like to just share with you is the estimated economic impact of unpaid informal family caregiving. This is a chart, this is old data. Uh, this is from 2012. But it's estimated that the, the economic effect, if you were to, to actually try to quantify in dollars the amount of unpaid informal family caregiving, what that would be worth, it's over $500 billion in America. The estimated economic impact of unpaid informal family caregiving exceeds the impact of the entire long-term care industry. The estimated economic impact of unpaid informal family caregiving exceeds the impact of the entire long-term care industry. So family caregivers are the unsung heroes of long-term care in America. And yet, family caregivers are often not recognized, ignored in the long-term care delivery system and in the healthcare delivery system. This is what the World Health Organization said, caregiving should be a concern for communities, governments, and society as a whole. But the role of family caregivers is often neither supported nor properly acknowledged. So hats off to Calvert, Charles, and St. Mary's counties for acknowledging family caregivers, for hosting this event, for providing some resources and some knowledge that will help you in your caregiving journey. So as we talk about this framework, and I, I'm gonna move this. It's, uh, I'm sorry, let me see, can I? There we go. All right. <clears throat> so as we talk about our framework for caregiving, it is marked by words that begin with the letter R. Now, I know that this is a little bit gimmicky. I totally recognize that. But if you walk away from here today and you simply remember these R words, then that'll be a success. Um, I like to use the, the R words because it makes it a little bit easier to remember. Everything that we're going to talk about today is rooted in research, either in social psychology, caregiving, or adult learning research. The way that it's all packaged together is really my original thinking. It's bringing in the, those different disciplines, those different lines of research into the focus on caregiving. And so um, we're going to talk about these different R words. There are six of them. The first word is roles, not the kind you eat for dinner, R-O-L-E-S. It's important to understand the roles in caregiving. <clears throat> now, I'd like to just step back for a minute and Think about, ask you this question, what is a role? Any thoughts? What's a role? It's your position. job as a person to, you know, what you need to do. Your, jo your job as a person, okay. And yeah, and what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So it ha it's tied to functions that you're performing in the social world. Position, your position. Your position, okay. Excellent, yes. The part you play, I love that. You're actually quoting William Shakespeare. You probably didn't know that. But William Shakespeare was uh, perhaps the first social psychologist. This is what William Shakespeare said. You've probably heard this, right? All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They all have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, the parts that you play. Well, roles are very important to us as human beings. Roles tell us who we are. When you ask yourself, who am I? Oftentimes you'll cite a role that you play. You'll say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a father. 
I'm an electrician. I'm a Marylander. So these different roles are often sometimes referred to as the hats that we wear. And as Shakespeare said, we wear lots of different hats. And now in social psychology, again, roles are extremely important because they teach us how we relate to one another as human beings. So we also think about roles in the context of drama and plays and film and television, right? Well, so if caregiving was a play, the lead actor is the care receiver. The care receiver is the first person to step out on the stage. The script of this play is written by the health conditions of the care receiver. The care receiver doesn't really get any say in the script. The care receiver has to follow the script that's written which is written by the emerging health conditions. The caregiver is a supporting actor. The caregiver is always, always the supporting actor in this play. The stage is the home or perhaps the facility if the care receiver is in a facility. Now, here is the thing about this play. Neither the caregiver or the care receiver auditioned for these roles. These roles were thrust upon them because of the emerging health conditions of the care receiver. Nobody asked to be in this play. This play is something that they have to undertake and be involved in. So, getting to our, our uh, thoughts and feelings and what you've heard, I'd like to ask you a question. Think about your situation, your caregiving experience. If your caregiving experience was a play, what would be the title? <coughs> what would be the title of your caregiving script? So take a minute and think about that. We're going to share. I'm going to invite you to share the title of your caregiving play, whatever that is. And then uh, secondary question, how would you describe your role? I'll give you a minute and then we'll, we'll share. Go ahead and write it, write it down for us. this thing roll? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so what would be the title of your caregiving script? Yes. Sheer madness. That's what popped into my head. Huh? That's a good There's already a play called Sheer Madness. That's a good title. There was that laugh of recognition. As soon as you said that, the whole room laughed. Yes, sir. Caregiver plus four. Caregiver plus four. Caregiver plus four. Wow. So can you, can you tell us what's, what's the plus four? Taking care of four people. Wow. For six, seven years, you've been caring for four people. Wow. Bless you. Caregiver plus four. Oh my. 
<laughs> yeah. Thank you. No social life. You you have been through a lot. Yeah. We have a comment uh, on the chat. Online. Uh, the title of this caregiving script, Mom Loses Mind Taking Care of Parents While Raising Her Own Kids. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. That was uh, Cat. Cat. Thank you, Cat. Everybody here laughed when they heard that title. Anyone else? The title of your caregiving script. Yes, ma'am. Roll switch. Roll switch. Roll switch. So tell us about that. That's, that often happens. Yeah, it is. Very demanding. So my title is Oh My. Oh My. <laughs> <laughs> Tell I mean, us about that. Oh My. Because he watched me go through it, I think he yeah. had a certain expectation, but his situation, our situation now is much different. Mm -hmm. It was with my parents. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have a sister, and my sister is well over 300 pounds, can't move, she's in a, in a wheelchair. Oh lives, My. Lives in, in Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, she had a husband who's well over 200 pounds, but he gets around more. Uh, but she basically can't take care of her. But she calls my mother, but her advice isn't necessarily, she doesn't know what's going on here. So she gives my mother advice, which is against the advice that we're giving the doctors are giving. So it's mm -hmm. like, yeah. trying to, she was working against what we're doing. I mean, when I first brought up the question about what are we going to do with mom, she said, I just hope she dies in her bed at night. Ooh. So, I mean, that was kind of the, the idea that, okay, she doesn't really want to take care of her. You know? Yeah. So Very difficult. It's all put on us, but, you know, like you said, at the last minute. And kind of, well, we kind of saw it over the years that we're going to have to do something. Yeah. And then the last time... We had gone up to her house in the summer. I mean, she was just falling apart. Her finances were a mess. Um, we just knew we had to do something. So. You know, there are a lot of people, just like the, the gentleman in the back and, and you, who serve in this caregiver role over and over again for different people in the family. And I see some, some nodding heads. You know, if you're one of those people, you just have this, this caring heart and this disposition. <coughs> to care for others. Did you have a, a script title? Well, I um, thought wrong turn. Wrong turn. Wrong turn. <laughs> Tell us about that. Supposed to be going forward. Supposed to be going forward. Of course, but you know when you have um, a loved one 
it all comes to an end, so it's wrong turn. Yeah, wrong turn detour. That's right. Yeah, you end up uh, displacing things in your life because of caregiving, right? So let's go to the second R word, which is relationships. Caregiving changes relationships. And an important part of caregiving is honoring the historic relationship that you have with your loved one. I'm going to share with you uh, something here called family caregiver identity theory in a minute. But um, when we think about human relationships, every single human relationship is unique. It's comprised of one individual who comes to that relationship with their personality, their background, their interests, and then another person who comes to the relationship with their personality, their background, their interests, and then together, as they interact, this relationship emerges. And every single relationship has unique properties. Your relationship with your boss is going to be different from your relationship with your mother, which will be different from your relationship with your neighbor. And even all of your relationships with your siblings will be different, right? Based on who they are and how they interact with you. Well, um, caregiving, when caregiving is introduced into a relationship, it fundamentally changes the relationship. And I'm going to share something with you called family caregiver identity theory. It's rooted in applied gerontology. It comes from two scholars, Rhonda Montgomery and Carl Kozlowski, who researched family caregivers for 28 years. They're internationally known applied gerontologists. Uh, Dr. Kozlowski is now deceased. He died of Parkinson's. But Rhonda Montgomery is a, a friend and colleague, and she actually read my book, and this is what she said about uh, when caregiving calls. She said, it's an easy to read book which provides family caregivers with valuable insights, guidance, and affirmation that reflect empathy and respect for their role. Poignant stories will help family caregivers and the professionals and other family members who support them. So in When Caregiving Calls, I talk about family caregiver identity theory. And again, this comes from Rhonda Montgomery and Carl Kozlowski. They studied some 20,000 family caregiver dyads. Dyads means two, the caregiver and the care receiver over the course of, like I said, 28 years. And they came to define family caregiving as a series of role-based transitions that are precipitated by the changing health conditions of the care receiver. Now, they depict this using a pie chart. And if the pie chart represents the totality of the relationship that you have with your loved one, that historically has been rooted in your historic family relationship. Now let's use the example here of a, of a spouse, a wife. So historically, this person in her relationship with her husband has been a wife. And being a wife, as the role of wife, has all kinds of meaning, all kinds of actions and interactions revolve around being a wife, right? Well, when her husband starts to have a little bit of sick, sickness or senescence, maybe he starts to forget a few things, the wife may just start to do a few things to pick up the slack. This is phase one of family caregiver identity theory. So the representation here is that caregiving duties are starting to enter into the relationship. In phase one, the wife may not even realize that she's doing caregiving. She may not even think about it. It might just be, oh, my husband needs a little hand paying the bills, no big deal, I'm gonna do this. Or my husband needs a hand getting in and out of the car. I'm going to do this. No problem. But as the husband's conditions decline, the wife starts to do more and more caregiving duties. By phase two, the wife starts to realize, wow, things are a little bit different now. Like, I'm, I'm doing different things for my husband than I ever have before. And I'm looking at him a little bit differently than I did before. And he's looking at me differently as well. By phase three, the wifely interactions are pretty much equal to the caregiver type interactions. By now, 
the family member may start to wonder, well, who am I in this relationship? Am I his wife or am I his caregiver? Because it feels like I'm a little bit of both. And well, how does he see me? And by phase three, the family member starts to realize this is only going to progress further. Phase four is when the caregiving interactions overtake the wifely interactions in the relationship. Now, if we change that word spouse, and we might say, let's say daughter, adult daughter caring for a parent. Uh, adult children have a very hard time often with this transition, that role, role switch that you called it, role reversal. If the mother who cared for you now requires care from you, things are going to be very different. The way that you interact with your mom will be different. The things that you do with your mom will be different. The things that you say to your mom will be different. The things that your mom says to you will be different. That relationship dynamic is going to change. So how do family caregivers deal with this evolving situation and these transitions in these roles? According to the research, there are three ways. Three ways to successfully move through this. One is accommodation. And this is rooted in adult learning, Piaget. Accommodation is where the family caregiver basically says, okay, my loved one, I've always, let's say it's a, an adult daughter who is caring for her mother. I have had this historic relationship with my mother. She's always been my mother, but now because she's old, because she's sick, she needs a caregiver. So I'm going to accommodate her needs and I'm going to step out of that role of, care, of, of daughter and I'm going to step into the role of caregiver. And I'm okay with that. That's the key. I'm okay with that. The second possibility is for the adult daughter to, again, reframe her thinking about this and say, okay, yes, that has, al that has always been my mom. She is my mom. She's still my mom. And I'm her daughter. I've always been her daughter. And being a daughter has always meant A, B, C, D, E. But now, because my mom is having these health conditions, I'm going to redefine what it means to be a daughter. This is called assimilation. I'm going to assimilate the daughter role and frame it in my own mind to encompass caregiving. So being a daughter for a mother who has these types of health conditions at this phase of life includes everything that I'm doing. And so by redefining who I am as a daughter in this relationship, I'm okay with that. I can keep going in this relationship. I'm okay with that. That's, the, that's again, very important. The third way that family caregivers adapt and adjust is by outsourcing the tasks of caregiving that are causing them the greatest degree of distress. A family caregiver may not be able to step out of the family role and into the caregiver role. The family caregiver may not be able to redefine what it means to be a daughter in this relationship, and that's okay. There are no right or wrong ways to do this, but if the family caregiver is struggling so much in their identity in this relationship, then it's time to step away from caregiving and turn over those caregiving responsibilities to other providers. And if the family caregiver does that, often it's kind of a rebalancing. Phase five would be a rebalancing of the relationship. Back to about phase two. So you may outsource the tasks of caregiving to a home care agency or to a long-term care facility. But as you let others cover those caregiving tasks, you can rebalance in your relationship and return to being a little bit more of a daughter or a little bit more of a wife compared to what you used to be. It is never going to be the same.
Now this is a lot easier said than done. I'm sitting here spouting this off. It's very academic, but it is rooted in research. It is sound. And when I first learned a family caregiver identity theory, I was blown away because I realized that as a son-in-law, I never was able to make this transition. I, my mother-in-law was in our home and I wanted her to be in our home. I wanted to help her. I loved my mother-in-law, but at the same time, I resented the fact that she was there. I'd go to work every day and I'd come home, I'd sit down after a long day at work at the dinner table and right there in front of me was my mother-in-law, night after night. And yeah, she had cancer, she had a brain tumor, she was going through radiation and chemo, and then she got a little bit better, but she was still there, day in and day out. And so I resented her being there. I, wanted, I, I started talking about my nuclear family, my wife, my children, and me. I didn't want my mother-in-law to constantly, constantly be in our business. But she was there every single minute of every single day. I got to the point that I couldn't look at her. I would sit at the dinner table and I'd just quietly eat. Just like this. I'd, I'd look down. I'd just look at my plate and eat. I wouldn't look up at her because she was right there, so I'd just look down. Just keep eating. And then when I was done, I'd pick up my plate and I'd take it to the kitchen and clean up. There was only one other person in my life that I could not look at. That was an employee who betrayed my trust and I fired that employee. You can't fire your mother-in-law. <laughs> so I had this identity conflict. I've heard Rhonda Montgomery explain it this way, using a rubber band. And I'm going to try to, I don't know if I can do this with the uh, mic. <laughs> I'm going to put the mic down for a second. So if this thumb represents what you are doing in the relationship, and this thumb represents what you think you should be doing in the relationship. So what you are doing and what you think you should be doing, when those are aligned, when what you are doing and what you think you should be doing are aligned, there's not that much tension. But as the distance increases between what you are doing in this relationship and what you think you should be doing in the relationship, you see how that tension increases and that pressure increases? And the further and further apart that is, the more that you are suffering a role identity conflict in that family relationship as a caregiver, the more that you need to reconcile that. <clears throat> So um, I took Rhonda Montgomery and Carl Kozlowski's theory, I applied it to paid caregivers, and Rhonda saw me do this, and I have a little story, but I'm going to skip that. But paid caregivers, they kind of go through the same, the same process. Paid caregivers, often as the, as the care receiver as well, they serve more as a companion. But as the care receivers needs increase, their health declines, they provide more and more hands-on assistance. And that PCA means personal care assistance. Skilled medical professionals, doctors, also go through a similar transitional phase. When the care receiver, when the patient is well, the doctor is more like a consultant, more like hands-off, you know, take two pills and call me in the morning. But as the care receiver's needs increase, as the patient's needs increase, the, um, the doctor brings more and more of their knowledge and their hands-on services to that patient and they become more and more of a provider. But the point here is that you are constantly adapting to the needs of the care receiver. That is what caregiving is, constant adaptation to the evolving needs of the care receiver. So I'd like to ask you, what has been the impact of the caregiver role on your relationship? <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I would say uh, it, it's been really up and down, you know, as, as my mother's condition has been under. There's definitely a lot of stress, a lot of, a lot of stress. I just feel like she wants to. 
She wants to consume you, take over. Yeah. She, she thinks she owns you. Yep. Very she common. Half the time she, thinks she, does. she thinks you're her mother. Very yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Well, this is, I'm the mom to a 52 year old daughter, and she's strong, walks two miles a day on the treadmill, and um, stage four, and it's a it's cancer. change in personality, I guess, with the chemo, mm -hmm. where, um, um, I mean, I go with her to, to various doctor appointments, but then she feels she needs to go with me uh, because she feels she's my caregiver. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes you know, I just have to keep my mouth shut, you know, and just kind of go on with the flow. I feel mm. like that's about all I can do. I mean, there's no, she's not advanced enough to, you know, she can get out and rake the leaves. Mm. It's a, a mind thing. Mm. Mother and daughter, which even in normal circumstances could maybe be a little testy, but, um, and there's no other family here. So I sold my house out west because there's no other help here with family. So anyway, it's a, it's a learning experience, mm. just a dynamic. So you feel like she actually still cons almost considers herself a caregiver for you, even though you're the one that relocated to come take care of her and I mean, her I condition. Can be a by myself, but oh no, no, she wants to go with me. So mm. if it makes her feel better, okay, but yeah. just keep her mouth shut. Do not take over the conversation of my medical problems. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Involuntarily recruited to the caregiver role yes, yes. <laughs> by the rest of the family. Yeah. You know, and then if we go to like one of the kids' ball games or something, she feels like maybe she's left behind. You know, it's you know, it's it's just tough to balance all of that. Yeah, thank you. And you, you touched on, you know, other family relationships that are also affected by caregiving. And if you're an adult child caring for a parent, there are siblings, and those dynamics can be affected by this. Some siblings are very helpful and very other understanding. Other siblings would rather just sit back and tell you what to do. <laughs> or just throw money at it, like that's the solution. Yeah, yeah. So in, in, uh, in When Caregiving Calls, I have a chapter on, on family, and we talk about this because, you know, um, in, in my family, and I've seen this in, a lot, in my home care company, there are 
you know, uh, siblings that might live in other locations and they just want to advise you on how to be a caregiver. Usually there's like the primary caregiver in the family and then there's the rest of the people. And you know, the rest of the members of the family, they cannot understand what it means to be a primary caregiver. They have not lived it. They don't live with that constant nagging concern, that worry, that knowledge that when you leave, your loved one is vulnerable, that you always have to be on call. You're never not on call as a caregiver, right? And so they don't live with that. So they just come in, they'll spend a few hours or maybe a few days with mom or dad and everything will be great. And mom and dad, mom or dad will say, oh, I just love Johnny, he's so great. And then she turns and yells at you because you didn't butter the toast properly, <laughs> right? That's the way it is, yes. Um, my frustration is I deal with a younger uh, sibling that is mentally ill oh. and I do not know how to deal with it. So I constantly yell, lose my temper, I don't understand it, I, you know, I just, I'm very frustrated and I'm, you know. Uh, and this is your care receiver? This is the person that you're caring yeah, for? Yeah, my, my brother uh, mm -hmm. is, um, just has a major mental illness. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it just, and it's affected our relationship with my husband, or my relationship with my husband because he's one who thinks uh, that mental illness is, you know, oh, just buck up and, you know, take care yeah. of it. Or, you know, he has a funny attitude about it, like it's not real. Yeah. And I keep, you know, I have arguments with him saying, you know, he can't help what he's doing. I mean, I'm trying to understand it myself, but, I, you know, I, it's very frustrating. Yeah. So some of what you're describing is normal. It's understandable. Good, I'm normal. That <laughs> That whole, you want to just scream, sometimes you want to cry, sometimes you, you don't want to, but you end up lashing out at the person exactly. unintentionally. Um, it's important for caregivers to, we're going to talk a little bit about this later, but to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. It's okay to realize that you as a caregiver might need a little bit of help. Counseling is something that is extremely useful for caregivers. Talking through some of this, just letting that out, I bet just, just expressing yourself That's here today. I and I we're <laughs> so let me just say, we're in a safe space today. What's shared here today is not going anywhere. Okay, I'm not gonna go and report this back to somebody else. I want you to feel very, very willing to just share. Um, but it's important for you to get, to get the help that you need to continue in this role. What I've ended up doing at his point is because I really can't talk to him, I say to myself, uh, God, please take care of my brother. And that helps me to get through dealing with him. I mean, I still check on him and I have contact, but I know I'm very, all he's got to do is say one thing and I'm pushing a button, he's pushed my button and I'm yeah. Boom. So that's I, I have to look at it that way or I, you know, uh, that's my best approach right now to handle it. That's a good approach. Okay. Let's go to the next R word, which is realities. As a caregiver, it's critical that you confront, honestly, the realities of the situation. So confronting realities is an important part of this process. Now let's be honest, the caregiving roles are not glamorous. You think about, you know, being a movie star, being on the stage, you know, you've auditioned, you've practiced, you're good looking and attractive and the spotlight's on you and you seek it. That's the glamor of uh, being in, in the role in, this, in a play. But uh, nobody really asked to be a caregiver. And even worse is being a care receiver. Who wants to be dependent on someone else for activities of daily living? The care receiver didn't ask for this. 
Everybody knows who this is, right? Who's this? Christopher Reeve, Reeve a.k.a. Superman. He was Superman in the 1979, was it 79, 80 movie? And I love talking about Christopher Reeve because here is, here is a guy who is just the ultimate in human physicality, right? Good looking, able to do anything with his body, and uh, just took his body for granted. And we know what happened to Christopher Reeve, right? In 1995, he had a tragic accident. He fell off a horse and he became paralyzed from the neck down, quadriplegic. It was shocking to see Superman in a wheelchair. And yet, uh, this, is, this is what happened to him. He wrote a, a memoir called Still Me while he was still alive. And he talked about this whole process he said, people often ask me what it's like to have sustained a spinal cord injury and be confined to a wheelchair. Apart from all the medical complications, I would say that the worst part of it is leaving the physical world, having to make the transition from participant to observer long before I would have expected. I like that quote because it really describes the process that care receivers go through. Your care receiver at one time was Superman or Superwoman. They took their bodies for granted. And now the body isn't working the way that it used to or the way that it's supposed to. And it may not be as dramatic as becoming a quadriplegic on a, in a moment, but slowly and steadily that decline is taking place. And the care receiver is watching themselves in their own lives slide from participant to observer. That is a hard reality of the situation. <clears throat> Caregiving forces us to confront marginalizing and stigmatizing assumptions about the human body. You know, our society teaches us that we're supposed to be like that, right? <laughs> You're supposed to look like that and be like that. I don't know if you can do that, but that's, that's kind of hard, right? I mean, that's impressive. Maybe at one point in your life you could do that, but uh, the body just gets to where you can't do that anymore. And so it can become very embarrassing when your body fails. You know, as we get older, the body starts to fail. This is the natural order of things. One of the first things to go is the eyes. So I see a lot of people here with glasses. I wear glasses, I hate wearing glasses, but anyway. So what happens if your eyes start to fail? You get glasses. If your ears start to fail, you get a hearing aid. If your hip fails, you get a hip replacement. If your heart fails, you get quadruple bypass surgery. And you know, we talk about all of these different body parts failing, and we talk about how we deal with them. But there are two parts of the body that also fail that we don't talk about the bladder, and the bowel. Those body parts fail too. Often, it's very common to deal with incontinence as you get older, as you have health conditions. But our society says that is a taboo subject. You don't talk about that. It's embarrassing. It's stigmatizing. It makes the care receivers feel less than human. In my home care company, one of my favorite clients was uh, Dr. Henderson, Mr. Henderson. He was a professor. And I love visiting with Mr. Henderson. I was getting my doctoral degree at the time that we had him, and I would go in and I could just talk to him for hours. He was super intelligent, but he was blind. And so he spent, he was about 89 years old, and I came to visit him one day, and he was in the back room. I walked down. He was laying on the bed, and as soon as he heard me, he got straight up and he looked over in my direction without seeing me because he was blind. And I said, hey, Mr. Henderson, how you doing today? He goes, I'm incontinent. And he just sort of swayed like this. That was his answer. I'm incontinent and silence. <laughs> I said, it's okay, it's okay, Mr. Henderson. I mean, it happens. But I thought about that later, and here's a man who had spent his entire life 
in books reading. And he was more concerned about his bladder than his eyes. <coughs> it shouldn't be that way. But incontinence is, is a reality of caregiving. Caregiving is also hard, not just physically, but also emotionally. Let's talk about just the, all the physical tasks that you have to do as a caregiver. There's a reason why so many caregivers get back injuries. All of the moving, the pulling, the pivoting, the ambulation requirements that you have to do to help, with, help your care receiver, that can be very physically demanding. All of the tasks of caregiving that you have to perform, it's a lot of work. But caregiving also is emotionally demanding. A caring role takes an emotional toll. There's something called emotional labor. Have you ever heard of it? It's actually in the research. Emotional labor involves all of the emotions that you must invest in the caregiving experience and in the relationship. There was a, there was a study of hospice workers. Hospice workers deal with people at end of life. And they found that front stage and backstage, we're using this analogy of a play, right? That front stage, when the hospice workers were in front of the patients and their families, they presented with this sense of compassion and professionalism and love. But then when they were backstage in the break room, away from the patients and their families, they were a lot more calloused, even cracking jokes about death and dying. And for them, this was a, a release. It wasn't, they weren't being insensitive. They were simply letting off some steam and dealing with the emotional labor that is required to be confronted with death on a regular basis. Emotional labor is what we do when we are constantly regulating our, mo our emotions for the person in front of us. So it's just like this young lady said here, here with her brother, trying to keep your cool. You might want to scream, you might want to cry, you might want to give that care receiver a piece of your mind, that Alzheimer's person who just keeps saying the same thing over and 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 over but you keep your cool, you keep yourself in check, you regulate your emotions because you don't want to rock the boat, you don't want to offend, you don't want to ruin that historic family relationship. So you're constantly suppressing what you feel. Emotional labor leads to something called compassion fatigue or caregiver burnout. This is where you're just overwhelmed, you're exhausted. You just feel physically and emotionally depleted. On top of that, we talk about the realities of caregiving. There's this environment that we're in right now, COVID. The last year and a half, 83% of caregivers report that they feel more stress. It's already a stressful role, but there's even more stress now because of COVID-19. You have to worry about the transmission of COVID to your loved one. You have more and more social isolation. You might be less inclined to bring in outside caregivers because you're worried about transmitting COVID. So if you can't bring in relief, that means that you have to do even more caregiving. So I ask you, what are some of the toughest challenges that you face some of the toughest realities that you are facing in caregiving today. Well, um, I'm not a caregiver any longer because my mother passed in 2014. Mm -hmm. But um, I found that one of the hardest things for me, because I live away from everybody else, but I had that once a month weekend with my mother where I would have to go and work all day, you get in your car and you drive three and a half hours. Yeah. And you gotta make sure they get some food and you gotta make sure they're in bed. And then you gotta get up in the morning and go marketing and cook these dinners and meals and 
it was just, it was overwhelming. And I heard you say earlier that it almost became a thing that you resented. Mm -hmm. And there was a point in my life where I, I was feeling resentful. And I just cried because it was overwhelming. Yeah. So, but yeah. That resentment is very normal in the, in the research on caregiving. And we're talking about realities. There are two G words in emotions that we, the two G words in caregiving. One is guilt and the other is grief. If caregiving has conjured up some intense feelings of guilt, it's very normal. Guilt about what you did, guilt about what you didn't do. The guilt conundrum can just overwhelm you sometimes. But guilt results from you sort of seeing what you think you should have done or think you should be versus what you see in the mirror. And you have to kind of let go of that guilt. If the question is, are you doing your very best? Your best is all you can do. Grief. A lot of people think about grief being associated with loss, and grief happens with the death of a loved one, absolutely. But a lot of caregivers also report anticipatory grief. Anticipatory grief happens before the death of a loved one. Anticipatory grief can be, you can be grieving over lost time. You can grieve over a lost relationship lost dreams of the future. You can grieve over the fact that you know that your loved one is going to die. They haven't died yet. But that grief can come in before death. Grief is messy. It is not linear. You've heard about the five stages of grief, uh, grief Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Uh, but it's not a linear process. It's messy. Five stages are denial, denial <laughs> acceptance, wait a minute, denial, anger. 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 Thanks, Daphne. Acceptance, so acceptance is one. Yeah. Depression. Mm, is it depression? Mm. Elis the, um, bargaining. Bargaining, yes. yes. Somebody can Google it. Google. It's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Thank you, Cindy. There you go. <laughs> you so let me, let, me, let me say that out loud for the, for the people on Zoom. It's denial, denial anger, anger bargaining, bargaining, depression, depression and, acceptance. and acceptance. But it doesn't happen in that order. All of those things come and go in that grieving process. All right, let's keep going. So we talk about these realities of caregiving. You know, some, sometimes it's tempting to ignore them, to just put them in the closet. Don't think about them. Sweep it under the rug. But to the extent that you can openly acknowledge them, that is the opportunity to open the door to address them. Don't ignore the hard realities that you're facing as a caregiver. Acknowledge them and figure out what you can do about them. But as you think about the realities, can you use a little bit of help? That's a rhetorical question. I see some people nodding their heads right now. If you answered that question, yes, I'd just like to tell you that it's okay for you to be the star of the show once in a while. You see, sometimes Caregivers need to be care receivers as well. So who helps caregivers? Well, here's a list. We talked a little bit about counseling earlier. If there was ever a time that you could use counseling, let me tell you, this caregiving responsibility is a time. We talked a little bit about extended family, sharing the caring formal care providers, caregiver support groups are amazing resources for caregivers. 
Like we said earlier, caregiving can seem like a very lonely, isolating road. But as you interact in caregiver support groups with fellow caregivers, you realize you're not alone. You can learn from each other, you can lean on each other, you can share resources, learn about things that are available in your community. Some support groups are organized around specific disease conditions. Some of them are more geographically oriented. There are online support groups. And I think that uh, Charles and St. Mary's and Calvert Counties might have some caregiver support groups also, right? So um, talk to your, your people if you're interested in joining one of those. I would highly recommend that. Seeing your doctor for your own health conditions. Friends. So the other day I was talking uh, with someone about my book. And they said, well, I liked one of the questions in your book. It was like the first question, which said, have you ever talked about your caregiving experience with someone else? And they realized that the answer to that was no. And just simply asking themselves that question, have I ever really talked about what I'm experiencing as a caregiver with someone else? When they realized that the answer to that was no, that told them that there was something wrong. You cannot bottle this up and keep it all in. You have to let it out. And it could be a friend. Just go have lunch with a friend and just tell your friend, hey, I just, I just want to just share with you what I'm going through. And if they're a good friend, they'll listen. They'll be supportive. All right. The next R word is rewards. Cultivating the rewards of caregiving is an important part of this process. You know, in the, in the caregiving research, there is so much focus on the hard realities of caregiving. There's so much focus on the burden of caregiving, on the stress of caregiving, on the emotional impact of caregiving. There is very little focus on the rewards of caregiving. There's not enough focus on this part of caregiving, if you ask me. Claire Stacy, who is a sociologist at Kent State University, she wrote a book on caregiving. This is a topic that she studies. She said, in When Caregiving Calls, the book considers aspects often overlooked, such as the rewards that come from caregiving, essential reading for those providing care as well as for policymakers and social scientists. <clears throat> so there are lots of rewards in caregiving. I'd like to share with you just a couple of examples from my experience. I was calling bingo. For a, in, a, in an assisted living facility. We had a 101-year-old client in my, from my company sitting right over here with his bingo card, and I was trying to call bingo for him, but it wasn't working out. Everybody else was getting bingo. And so after about the fifth attempt, uh, he lost again, and I said, oh, Mr. Mr. Mitchell, you were close. He said, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. <laughs> Love that. That's true. Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. So I learned that from, from uh, Mr. Mitchell that day. But, you know, these spontaneous things that the care receiver might tell you, you know, they stick with you. Here's a, uh, a painting from a 95-year-old uh, a woman that we cared for. 95 years old, receiving help with activities of daily living, and yet she still had the dexterity to paint that picture. What a powerful lesson for me. I bought it from her, I paid $150 for that thing. <laughs> Family caregivers report profound rewards from caregiving. You have the opportunity to learn from your care receiver. If you've been around someone who's dying, you can learn a lot about living. Family caregivers say that one of the rewards of caregiving is knowing that their loved one is receiving the best possible care because, you know what? Chances are pretty high that nobody's going to have as much of an interest in providing loving, compassionate, supportive, attentive, constant care. Nobody's going to do that quite as well as you. Caregivers report a greater sense of purpose and meaning in life. Caregiving makes you a better human being. 
Caregiving also often enhances relationships. Sometimes these estranged relationships can improve during these twilight years of life when caregiving enters the picture. One family caregiver said, being a caregiver for my dad was the toughest job I have ever had, and yet what a privilege to be there for my parent during the last year of his life as he was for me during my first. Another family caregiver, being a good caregiver has many answers, I'm sure. However, in my case, it was the fact that my mom had total confidence in me. That's amazing. My mom had total confidence in me. My mom trusted me enough with her life. It was tough, but caregiving did a lot for my soul. I was able to make sure he knew I loved him, not just in deed, but in words. I was able to help him deal with his pain. And what an amazing feeling to know that you have comforted someone you love. The greatest reward is being able to give back to him. He was my big brother and he did a lot for me, and there is no price I can attach to how great I feel even now that I had the opportunity to give back and let him know that I loved him. So what are some of the rewards that you have found in caregiving? Well, I found that the most rewarding thing for not only me, but for my other, my four siblings, was that when my mother closed her eyes for the very last time, we knew that we had done everything possible to make her last years comfortable and as pleasant as we possibly could. And yes, there were times she would Yin, 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 and we would yin, 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 back. <laughs> but there was it was all out of love. So you know I, I can talk about the relationship and the caregiving of my mother because it was a reward to me. It was truly a reward to be able to you know see her stretched out there and know that you've done everything you could for this person. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah. I know I, I feel good about myself because I feel like I did the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like you know, I did the best thing. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. You know, you just feel like this is the most important job I have right now. You yeah. know, everything else you have to just prioritize um, your time primarily. You know, for me, it's all about time because I still have my own business. Wow. Um, but I, I work from so that helps a lot. You know, you'll, you will never, ever regret this time that you spent as a caregiver. And when you've done everything that you can, uh, you feel good about what you've done, you have the rest of your life to remember that. And if you slacked, if you didn't do the best you could, you'll have the rest of your life to remember that as well. Reward. Short, short story. I, I, um, my grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, is a, a person that I would love to be, but will never be. Um, you know, grew up on a farm and you know, did all those kinds of things. Anyway, um, we were caregivers for my grandmother. She moved into my mother's home, um, and she wasn't feeling well. She wound up in the hospital. It was at Christmas time, um, and so I had a business, and every Christmas morning. We all come together, have breakfast, and everybody gets a flower. Everybody goes, of course, bring the flower to the table. Anyway, she wasn't going to be able to be there. And so she was in the hospital, so I left work and went there to visit with her. And uh, she said, you know, she said, uh, and I brought the flower that she wasn't going to have the next day. Uh, she said, you know, I'm just tired. You know, she said, I'm, I'm worn out, I'm tired. She was 92. Uh, and I said, you know, no dying on Christmas Day. I said, you know, we'll be no dying on Christmas Day. And we chatted a little bit, you know, and then I went home, and 20 minutes later, the hospital called and she had died. But she didn't die on Christmas Day. So, and I have to say that, you know, <coughs> what I got from that was a lot, you know, I, and, I, and there wasn't a tear, not a single tear, because she had lived a good life. Mm -hmm. And she was always kind of sort of a person in control. 
and being able to not die on Christmas Day uh, was a big thing for a family. And, uh, so, you know. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Just, you know, caregivers have the privilege of being there, of being there for those moments. You're not going to have those moments if you're not there. And you know, um, the point that you raised is, and I, I, I have been around a lot of older people near death, and I do believe that there is an element of choice as to that moment that you go. Your grandmother or grandmother-in-law um, didn't want to die on Christmas Day. She, she, she did it before, right? The day before, yeah. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. So sometimes, sometimes they wait. They wait until each family member has come and paid a visit. And then when the last one has, has been there, that's when they're ready. Sometimes it takes a caregiver holding the person's hand and saying, it's OK. It's OK. It's time to go. It's OK. We'll be OK. Wow. And so my father-in-law, who had Parkinson's, we got to a point where he just couldn't take care of me any longer. He was home for as long as he could be home. So he was going to a nursing home. And so, and I had made arrangements, you know, financially, we had taken care of all that. But anyway, he said to me, how much does this cost? <laughs> That motivated him, the cost motivated him to accelerate <laughs> the, the process. Well, it was more important for him to leave the money than to the was sure. the nursing home. But he clearly, but he clearly, it was yeah. a process that he was going through. Yeah. Um, and, it, and actually, Dr. Jarbo, who was at the nursing home at the time, said you know, we had issues with siblings, you know, mm -hmm. interacting. And he came to us and said, listen, I'll take care of him, you take care of the family. And uh, so he went through this process. And like I say, it was only two weeks. Thank you for sharing that. So we've talked about four of the R words, roles, relationships, realities, and rewards. All of these come to bear in this caregiving experience. And your caregiving experience also affects these different aspects of your life. So I'm going to share a little uh, video right now. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that the audio can be heard. And when the cloud in the sky starts to pour in your life, it's just a storm you're braving. Well, don't tell yourself you can't lean on someone else, because we all need safety. Sometimes 
Everything that we've talked about so far pertains to the social dynamics of caregiving. But caregiving is full of the checklist of tasks. There are so many things that you have to do all the time as a caregiver. And in all of the dialogue about caregiving, there's so much emphasis on the tasks of caregiving that uh, when we talk about the social dynamics of caregiving, those are often neglected. But by understanding the social dynamics of caregiving, you're understanding on a deeper level what's happening and it's a mindset change. We're talking about something, you have knowledge now that can help you to frame your caregiving experience differently and change your mindset as a caregiver so that you can endure and continue over the long trajectory of the role. And so as I develop this model of caregiving, you know, these different R words, I thought, well, this is great, you know, we have, we've talked about these social dynamics and the mindset change that caregivers need to go through. But if this is to be a comprehensive model, we need to say something about the tasks of caregiving because they are pervasive and the central focus of action in caregiving. So what about all of the physical requirements of caregiving? And I try to think of an R word. It has to be an R word to balance out the model. And I came up with this word, readiness. Practicing for readiness. Readiness encompasses your ability to deliver on the tasks of caregiving that are required by your loved one when your loved one needs help, wherever your loved one needs help. If you are ready to deliver on the tasks of caregiving, you can deliver on those physical requirements. So how do you develop readiness as a caregiver? You know, you're not given some handbook, some guidebook, some instruction manual, some formal education to be a family caregiver. It just doesn't happen. Well, I'd like to share with you a study by a learning theorist named Paul Hager. He studied caregivers that worked in a dementia care unit in Australia. These caregivers had no formal training in caregiving, but yet they developed their own way of figuring out how to help the people with dementia in their unit through a process that they called showing, guessing, and trying. Showing, guessing, and trying. What, is, what do you think that means? When you think, think of showing, guessing, and trying. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. I guess it might not be exactly the thought that yeah. they're thinking, but they're just going to keep on shooting out there, and then that way people around them can be like, oh, well, maybe it's this. Yeah. I don't know about trying. Just not giving up, you know. Just keep so it's a lot of experimentation, yeah. isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is literally trial and error. Yeah. Practice makes perfect. You develop skills to deliver on the tasks of caregiving by just doing it. You may not know how to transfer your loved one from the bed to the bedside commode, but you're gonna figure it out. You may not know how to give an insulin shot, but you're gonna figure it out. You may not know how to create this balanced diet that your loved one needs because of their health condition, but you're gonna figure it out. The only way to develop your capacity to deliver on the tasks of caregiving is through practice. Even medical professionals, they come with this knowledge of medicine, but there are so many caregiving tasks that they don't know how to do, and they have to figure it out. So as you practice, you practice, you practice, you try and you fail, you try and you fail, and then you get better, and eventually, you develop a system that allows you 
to be prepared to deliver on the tasks of caregiving. So I'd like you to just think for a minute about your caregiving experience, what you're doing for your loved one, and what is a caregiving task that maybe you didn't know how to do before, but now, thanks to practice, you are ready to do. Taking care of caregivers were quadriplegic. <coughs> um, my dad was killed when I was 11. My brother no longer here when he was 20. He broke his neck and was a quadriplegic. So he came to my mother's home. So my mother was primary. I was secondary, I'm going to say, I guess. Nobody wow. transfer him. I was looking at you know the Superman slide that you that you had. Yeah. You know, you see him and then you see him in a chair. What you don't see is the process of him getting in that chair. Yeah. Uh, what it takes for the caregiver or caregivers to be able to transfer him, roll him over. You don't see you don't see um, having to get up in the middle of the night to turn him so he doesn't have bed sores. Uh, you don't see transferring to the wheelchair because he has to go to the doctor and there's no one at the doctor to be able to lift him and transfer him. Yeah. You see him getting dental help because he can't get in the chair and you have to find a dentist that's willing to work on him in the chair. Mm -hmm. You have to put up with his, his anger because he has to have suppositories, he has to have a pro, and he considers that to be just demoralizing. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to learn to cope with that and then frank with you, my brother was a quadriplegic in that chair for 30 years. They said that he would live to be, uh, probably live 10 years. Mm -hmm. But the advancement of medical science allowed him to live longer and longer and longer, and he got bitter and more bitter the whole time. So you have to learn to be able to cope with that, being in the same room with, with that anger. And so seeing him as Superman and seeing him in the chair, there's so much in between yeah. that you never that you never, you don't see, you're not prepared for, you're not ready for it, um, but then you have to, you have to work through it. Yeah. So. Have you read the Christopher Reeve book? I have not. So he, he talks a lot about his own thinking and his mind and what he went through, a lot of the types of things that you're discussing as a patient, what he had to do just to, just to breathe. He talks about breathing. Right. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting book to read. Um, but uh, thank you for sharing that. Employment. I mean, he was yeah. unemployable. Yeah. So, so I employed him. I was just, just that I was allowed to. Yeah. I set it up so he could do marketing and employment. But then even that wasn't fulfilling. You know, yeah. Sitting in that wheelchair all the time. So. Thank you. Anyone else, a caregiving task that, thanks to practice, you are now ready to do that you never would have been able to do before? Being an advocate, yeah. Being an advocate, it takes a lot of work to do, just get stuff coordinated and yes. work with every, all the people that are around you to get things done. That comes with the caregiver role, and um, you learn that as interacting with Especially providers. If you're introverted or maybe you're not as out there, it's probably more of a struggle for you to make those phone calls and speak yeah. to one person about everything that you need or that you're, you're who you're caring for needs. You know? Yeah. Back when, you know, 30, 20, 30 years ago, they didn't even know what Alzheimer's was and dementia. <clears throat> and then seeing my father, you know, like not even recognize me or he hit me, you know, tried to hit me with a cane one time. And I'm like, who is this? I, I, this is not my father. I kept telling myself this, is, but um, it was me that was, didn't really know and they called it dementia back then. They didn't yeah. even, uh, you know, or I didn't, never heard of dementia. So I had like three or four years of dealing with a situation that I did not know. And my father was very independent. He practically raised us three kids. So 
I was uh, trying to accomplish his wish to give him, let, let him stay in the home, but it, you know, we were having police there every day, caregivers, I mean, you name it. Yeah. But this dementia is like, you know, like, a, I mean, I didn't know. I just kept saying, this is not my dad. This is, yeah. who is this person? So, um, but the best advice I learned from that is when, after years of going through that, I had a nurse come and sit us at the table, the family, and said, uh, do you love your father? I said, yes, I love your father. She said that if you love your father, you will get him in assisted living, because I kept trying to keep him in the home, and that was the best advice I had. She said, if you love your father, you will get him the help that he needs, and that was the best thing I learned from, you know. Thank you. Years when it comes to placing your loved one in, an, in a facility, oftentimes we, we think about the services that the patient or your loved one needs and the capability of the facility to meet those needs. But there's a third, and those are two important parts, but there's a third part of this decision, which is the capacity of the family to care outside of the facility. And if your loved one is exceeding, if your loved one's needs are exceeding your capacity to meet them, there is nothing wrong with considering a facility. And sometimes people think, oh, you know, it's, it's failure if I put my loved one in a facility, or I'm denying their wishes. But an, in a facility, you have a team of people who are available 24-7 to meet the ongoing never-ending needs of the care receiver. You might be able to do that outside of a facility, but if you can't, there is no shame in placing your loved one into a facility. There is no right or wrong answer to some of these decisions that you have to make as a caregiver. There's just trade-offs. So this is our model of caregiving resilience. Understanding roles honoring relationships, confronting realities, cultivating rewards, and practicing for readiness. Caregivers that do all of these things are resilient caregivers, and that's our sixth R. This model is a framework for you to think about your caregiving experience. Most of the challenges that you face as a caregiver can be contextualized in one of the prongs of this model. This is a learning model. So if you take any given caregiving situation and you look at it through this lens and you ask yourself what's going on in roles, relationships, realities, rewards, and practicing for readiness, you'll be able to figure out, well, where, where, are there, where is there an opportunity for improvement? As a professional, if you work with caregivers, you might take out this model and talk through it. Go through each of those R words and say, well, tell me about what's going on in your relationship with your loved one. Let's talk about the hard realities that you're facing. How can we confront those better? How are you doing cultivating the rewards of caregiving? Sometimes caregivers, especially when you're in the thick of it, and you're in the most difficult times, it can be hard to step back and recognize some of the rewards that are there. One of the things that I recommend to caregivers is a gratitude journal. Just taking time to write down things that you're grateful for. Are we about out of time? Okay, ten, ten, we have 10 minutes? Okay. Gratitude journals are wonderful because by looking for the good, you'll find the good. If you don't look for the good in the situation, it's gonna be a never-ending, exhausting cycle. But if you step back and you look for the good, you'll find the good. It could be something so simple, so simple like, oh, you know, my loved one went to the bathroom today without soiling themselves. I'm grateful for that. It could be, a heartfelt, sincere conversation with your loved one who's had dementia and hasn't had lucidity for days. 
But by looking for the good, you find the good, and you, you find a little bit that the situation it maybe is a little bit better than you thought. When my mother-in-law got cancer, I didn't understand any of this. If I was to go back and hit the rewind button, I would be a much better caregiver today. But I don't have that opportunity. What I've shared with you is the result of over 20 years of focus in the caregiving space. I hope that uh, I've imparted something that will help you in your caregiving journey today. The book is available. I'm going to have it outside. Um, it's, uh, there's a table out here. It's $15. If you would like to buy one, I'd be happy to uh, sign it for you and dedicate it to you or whoever you would like me to dedicate it to. Uh, this is a, a hospice nurse who read the book. She said that when Caregiving Calls is written with passion and wisdom, she called it a must read for personal and professional caregivers. Where can you get it if you're not here today? Great question. So you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on in brick and mortar bookstores. Any, some people like to buy from independent bookstores. You might have to special order it, but it is available through any bookstore. Um, it's also available on the publisher's website. And with National Family Caregivers Month, you can get it for 20% off at the um, publisher's website, which is rivertownsbooks.com. Rivertowns, that's towns with an S, rivertownsbooks.com, and the code is uh, CARE1121 to get the 20% off. Just want to tell you really briefly what's in the book. It has 18 chapters. These are the titles of all of the chapters in the book. Each chapter pertains to something that is relevant to family caregivers. And um, as I was writing the book, I kept thinking of family caregivers and what do family caregivers need to know? So I wrote these 18 chapters and it's written in very accessible, relatable language. This is not um, an academic book, although everything is rooted in research, but it's written, it's supposed to be very understandable and easy to read. They're very concise chapters. And, uh, and then I thought, well, it's great to write a book that informs caregivers. But how can I create a book that could potentially transform their caregiving experience? And this is where my background in adult learning comes into play. Research shows that intentional reflection is a gateway to learning. And so at the end of every chapter, there are questions for reflection. So in the chapter on uh, home, for example, you read a little bit about home. And then there are some questions that relate to what you just read, asking you to apply what you just read to your situation. And even writing about it, writing your answers. Um, an early reader of the book, a family caregiver, said, well, I asked her about the questions for reflection. She goes, well, I liked the questions for reflection, but I didn't like the questions for reflection. And I said, well, what, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, I guess there were just some things that I did not want to think about. But then she paused and she goes, but I knew I had to think about them. So they were good. So she summed up the value of the questions for reflection. It gets back to that confronting realities thing. See, she wanted to just kind of sweep stuff under the rug and not think about it. But if you go through this process and you, you read and then you intentionally reflect, you will find solutions to your caregiving challenges. Oftentimes I find that family caregivers themselves have access to the best solutions. They might just need a little help with asking the right questions. And so this book asks good questions, thought-provoking questions that will help you to reflect on your experience and figure out how to make life better. And what was that code for 20% off again? CARE1121. So as we wrap up, I want to just say thank you for being a caregiver. What you do 
makes a difference in the lives of the people that you serve every single day. You may not feel like, it may, it may feel like a thankless job, but it's an important job. And uh, without you, your loved one would be in a much more difficult position. So that little card, I don't know if everybody, we had a few late arrivals. Did everybody get a card? Alicia handed out some cards. So um, let's make sure that everybody has a card. I'd like to invite you to uh, go back and think a little bit on what you've heard, what you felt, what you've thought about today, and write down on your card something that you're going to do that you want to remember, something that you want to do differently or do better in your caregiving experience. And then um, take that card home with you and put it in a place that you'll remember it, that you'll see it. And it'll be a nice little reminder to you of uh, what you've learned today. If you're so inclined, I'd love to get a picture of your card. Just take a picture of it like uh, Beth Ball did there. And, uh, you know, send, send me a picture of your card. You can tweet it, you can put it on LinkedIn, you can add it to the Facebook page if you want on social media. I promise I'll respond. You can email it to me. There's my email address. Uh, the website is caregivingkinetics.com. But uh, I love to hear your feedback and what you've, what you've heard and what you've received from this presentation today. Again, it's been a privilege for me to be here with you. I've really appreciated your comments and your insights. I've learned from you today. And I think we've all learned from each other. Thank you so much. <laughs>